So a few weeks ago, I uh, I started writing my own story. Right, started delving into the past rather than going into the future, and um, I was quickly surprised. It was probably the most painful thing I've ever done in my whole life. If you've ever had the chance to really sit down and you know think about what's gone on, what's led you there, um, even if you've I guess being characterized as having quite a positive journey. There's a lot of dark stuff there that we, um, I think we naturally forget. And so when Hanish contacted me and said that I would um, be speaking here, I instantly went on the website and I started looking at all the talks and I realized that, yes, I was going to be quite young compared to them. <laughs> and um, for that reason, I potentially might not have the same grand you know, story to tell. And so I came in with the intention to not uh, really tell my story and I wanted to talk about something that had occurred to me while I started writing my own story which was on the nature of stories themselves and that I kept thinking about and in the end I realized I had to tell my story to get to that anyway so um, I guess I'll get started. Now my story really starts at the age of 15 that's where I really think the first big thing happened and I was um it was around the time of my birthday the same weekend as my birthday and I was um, lying in bed, it was probably 3 a.m. in the morning, it was holidays, and I was watching YouTube just like you know, any other school kid does in the holidays. And um, I was watching, I think it was my favorite musician, he was a vocalist, and he was um, on a podcast show. And I was almost falling asleep, and in that sort of half awake, half asleep state, I heard him say that for him, martial arts was the most trans uh, transformative experience he's ever gone to. It was the perfect combination of the physical and mental aspects of the human experience and of self-mastery. And I suddenly woke up and I didn't know what to do for a few seconds, but then I went to Google and I did a Google map search. I said, you know, martial arts studios near me. And at three in the morning, I decided that the next day I would go to um, my local martial arts studio, Wing Chun studio, um, on my own accord. And why that was so important to me, it was the first time I had decided to do something on my own accord. I didn't feel like I needed to consult my parents. I felt like this was right for me. And if I felt it was right, you know, it was my, um, that was the sign to go out and do it. And so I told my parents, you know, I'm gonna do martial arts from now on. And we um, called up the guy and, you know, we uh, got in the car and drove off to his um, space the next day. And I live in the southeast suburbs of um, Melbourne in Pakenham. And Pakenham doesn't cop the best rack, um, rap, sorry. Uh, in terms of we have some drug problems and stuff like that in the suburb and we just happened to find this guy's house right in the middle of that area of the neighborhood <laughs> and there was no signage there was no you know martial arts studio here it was just one of those very small houses um, garage you have to go around you know you would have to leave you wouldn't be seen from the street going into this place so my parents were quite worried but anyway it turned out there was this old 50 year old Chinese guy teaching you know martial arts Wing Chun from his studio there it was like the Chinese version of um, so Miyagi, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, that started a one-year journey for me. Um, very transformative. I, what that gave me was, um, I guess, empowerment. I realized that it was really I who was in charge of my story. That I could write it. That if I made a decision to do something and I believed in it enough, I could go out and do it. Which is great. It was amazing. I, I absolutely loved that time. And I was fortunate enough to do the uh, Qigong session earlier today. And um, Wing Chun is built on that uh, same principles and philosophy, so it was a really good like flashback moment. But anyway, uh, there was a big problem. I was at school, right? So I suddenly had all this self-confidence. I can do whatever I want. I can transform myself, become whoever I want to be. And you know, my teachers weren't really down with that. They were just like, you know, just do the work. And you know, like when you're 18, that's that's when all the cool shit starts, right? <laughs> so um, there was only I, I'd also started uni. I was um, in year 12. I could swap out. A VC subject for a uni subject, and I thought, you know, uni is going to be the answer, right? It's like become an adult, I get to study what I want, I get to do what I want, and I quickly found that it was very much a similar system, but I guess for adults in a sense, you know, you still had a curriculum, you still have to abide by certain rules, and that with my principles that I was developing at the time in martial arts, that you know didn't go down too well. So I really did the only sane thing in my mind at the time, and that was to drop out. But for pretty much everyone around me, that was the most insane thing you could ever do. Um, luckily, my parents thought it was quite the same. Um, and so I was sort of left in the middle of nowhere, and I was lucky enough to come along a co-working space, a space called Hub in Melbourne. 
and um, I know a lot of you guys are from here. Can we have a little cheer if you know of Hub Melbourne or if you... Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know in the hero's journey, right, this is really important in the hero's journey, um, is that when the hero finds the place they truly belong, they really get that passion and that energy to start doing stuff. And when I came to the Hub, I instantly knew I belonged. I saw all these people you know, around me who were working on their own stuff, had this belief in themselves, they wouldn't let themselves be you know, told what to do by you know, their employers or their education or whatever it was. It was, it was like magic. Um, but I needed an idea, right? If you're at the hub, you, know, you, can't, you can't just sit around and do nothing. People are like, <laughs> so yeah, what is it you do? And there's a good saying, I love this entrepreneurial saying, it's like, keep improvising until they believe you, right? Just keep, keep talking about ideas until one of them like, oh wait, that's actually really good. And you're like, cool, that's what I do now. <laughs> um, but fueled with my passion around education and what I saw happening, in the education system, I realized I wanted to create change, that I wanted to help kids become self-directed. That word was very important to me, self-direction. That, um, you know, it was up into the, at the end of the day, we all have to influence the next generation, right? They're shaped by the opportunities we give them. But that story that they're writing, such as the story that I sat down to write myself, yeah, the pen needs to be in their own hands, like earlier today about um, authorship, it's not about ownership, it's authorship. Um, Anyway, so I created a social enterprise around this idea of changing the way education might work called CoLearn with a school friend of mine, um, who's still a close, my close business partner now. And the whole idea is that we would take this inspiring co-working model from Hub and we would apply it to education, right? And we, we saw learning and working as just two sides of the same coin. You, you work and then you learn, you work and you learn, you, you fail and then you iterate, right? Um, so this is great, we started formulating this idea, we started looking at facilitation models, spaces, we started talking to libraries, the government, to um, you know, learning organizations, and over the course of that year, because when I was, at 15 I started martial arts, at 16 I dropped out, and then all the way up to 17 I was working on this social entrepreneurship thing. And uh, just like the you know, entrepreneurship hero's journey goes, you, know, you have those rises and you fall, you, you make a success, you, you know, drop down again, but you learn, you know, oh, you have to make partnerships for your, you know, and then you make your next success, but you fall, oh, no, it's, it's about funding now, and then you keep going like that, up and down, and up and down, and up and down. And um, I don't know what it was about the time, but it was about two months ago, I was turning 17, I don't know if it was a build-up of stress, or it was coming off the high of probably our biggest accomplishment, which was um, being keynote speakers at um, the Pearson Conference this year in Australia, and Pearson is the largest learning organization in the world, so we were you know, amazed by that, but it put everything in perspective, um, because the founder of Hub Melbourne um, and Hub Australia, um, Brad Krauskopf, um, we had a meeting um, once, and he, he heard about my idea in that, and obviously it's very similar to the co-working idea, um, and I asked him, you know, what do you think, what do you think, I was, you know, he was my idol at the time. And he said, you know, it's brilliant, brilliant, can work, you know, if you have the right passion and determination or work, but five years minimum. Like, you know, five years of your life minimum every second of every day. And, you know, that hit me quite hard. I realized maybe I have to think about this, you know, turning 17, do I really, is this how I want to change the world? Is this how I want to write my story? Since I dropped out of school, every single day I'd wake up and tell myself what I would look like in five years. I, I never looked at the past. I was always, you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to be this. And I... This is why I bought this bag along today, because this is how I sort of visualize it, right? So this is my story. If this represents two years of my life, this is when I'm 15 to 17. Now, all the time before that, right, um, I feel like I wasn't writing this story. When, when you're 12 and you're 8 and that, you go through a lot of brilliant experiences that shape you forever, but, you know, you're, you're not really the one with the pen. You're not making the decisions for yourself. And so maybe there's like eight or nine books before that that were sort of written by someone else. And then I realized how many books there were in front of me. And if there's 40 books in my life, I have about 30 to go. So this is the one book I feel like I have ownership over, and this is the blank space left. And yes, yeah, sort of, it keeps on coming. That's what I'm trying to get across here. And what I realized then was maybe I have to think about it more, that I had to do what um, Hench Curry was explaining earlier. This was a, not the greatest way of thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> fail, iterate, fail, iterate. <laughs> um, 
yeah, yeah. So the trembling hands, you know, doesn't really work too well. <laughs> but as Hamish was saying, it's, it's it was that process of understanding that I have to let go a little bit, which at 17 is kind of crazy, right? That I had sort of fast forward and got to that sort of where I realized I was overcomplicating, I was overriding my story into the future, and this this um, sort of process of looking back on my story and realizing I'd been doing that um, made me come to a few realizations. Now, let me get back to the book with some of the notes in it, that might be a little bit helpful. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today is our ripple effect and how stories um, impact the ripple effect, right? When we go out into the real world. Um, so the lessons I learned was firstly that although you have to be um, the one writing your story, you have to be open to other people influencing your story. That all of our individual stories that's what pluses together to create the world story, the story of humanity, the bigger picture that we all love to talk about. And thirdly, and this is very special to me, is that there's always blank lines to keep writing on. And that's, that's what um, I want to talk about today, because this all comes back down to the ripple effect. So, in being shaped by each other, right, I realized that when I look back, when I was writing my story, and um, you know, everyone told me to be really proud of my achievements, right? That you, you've done amazing things with your life, right? But I trace back, you know, what got me interested into martial arts? Well, I just, just happened to be listening to a podcast that inspired me. You know, what made me believe in being self-directed? Well, it just happened to be my Sifu was very much of that mentality. Um, why could I drop out of school? I just happened to have very supportive parents that you know didn't mind that idea. Everything that I had achieved, right, had been me being open to other people's ideas. And that's why in this story of um, self-direction, although it's important that we start giving learners around the world the pen to start writing their story, we also have to be super mindful of the opportunities we give them. As I started figuring out, if I have 40 books right, the 2 billion people under 20 around the world have something like 30 or you know, 40 billion books worth to write. That's, that's humanity's story, isn't it? And the previous generations or the current generations, the opportunities you give these guys are really going to shape that. So um, that, was, that, that was the first sort of thing that I realized. And then in terms of the world story, you can sort of break that down, can't you? I like to think of these past 48 hours as the do story. As in, we've all come here with our individual stories, but we've sort of, you know, it's synergy, right? It's like sum of all parts is, you know, or the whole is, so I'm getting the saying wrong. But anyway, the, the do story is very special because it's the sum of all our, you know, individual stories, but we couldn't predict that to happen. So. I started realizing these things. And then I came across a philosopher, right? I'm very interested in philosophy. And um, he's a 20th, 20th century philosopher. Um, I didn't realize he was very famous. I'd, like, I'd never heard of him before. He was called Jack the Ritter. And um, he was talking about the nature of stories, or the nature of language. Because it was established in philosophy very early on that the whole world, or everything that humans know, comes back down to language. It's not that we communicate in forms of language, but the way our brain builds our model of the world is just through signs and language. You know, why is a coat a coat? Why is red red? It's because we've built up this, you know, little brain communication system since, you know, the day we um, were born. And so we wanted to figure out, okay, so seeing as the world is made up of language, what what is the nature of that language? And the most incredible sort of realization he came to is that no language or no form of communication, like a story ever has a complete meaning. As in every story is waiting for more lines to be written to change um, the meaning of the earlier act. So if I told you that there was a cat, right? You all come up with your own individual you know, ideas of what that cat is. But then if I say, well, the cat is green, suddenly you have to change that, you know, the meaning of what that cat is. And there's always space for more meaning to change. And then I realize it's the same with stories, right? No matter what is written down in hard writing, no matter what I've written down in these books, I've got blank space head which is going to define what I've already done. And I realized that that black line, uh, blank line stuff can be applied to anything. So for my story, that was very important. <coughs> for the learner's story, that was even more important, as in we, we shouldn't judge learners on what their prior history has been. That no matter what, and we've heard some of those stories today, that no matter what happened beforehand or happened in the past can be redefined um, in the future. I think Dennis's story was the greatest thing. You know, the film one and film two, right? Film two is sort of the past. It's nice to look back from film two and look at film one. Um, 
and sort of admire that change and suddenly film one doesn't come that bad anymore because it's put in a context where well that was necessary to get me to film two mm -hmm. and no matter if there's a film three you know that changes the way you perceive film one and all you know it, it's this liberating idea that no matter what has happened in the past we can um, sort of change the meaning of that in the future and that brings me to do lectures right so it's a bit of wishy-washy talk I'm throwing around I'm sorry about that but it's got a practical application and that's in the ripple effect in the actions that we produce here because I have felt the story here actually I was writing down in this book not only was I writing down my story but I was writing down like sort of the one-liners that just the things that just made me smile right the things that have characterized the new story you know the stuff we're going to remember um, like on the top of the page is Cole's snippets I think we're all going to remember some of the stuff Cole said I, I, I'm just in absolute admiration of that sort of um, I think it's like lateral thinking, just linking up everything to everything. Um, the, you know, the first note on the violin we heard when um, Rachel was um, showing us what flow improvisation looks like. And all these things are a part of the do story now. They're on the page. You know, we can't change that. And we will come here to collectively create that. What's really interesting when we think about the blank lines ahead is that the do story doesn't finish when we all go home, right? It's still going to be continued in the individual actions we carry out there. You know, why, was do, why is do so meaningful is the impact it creates out there and not just in here, right? And so um, I'm a really big fan of um, facilitation and um, embodiment in that as much as we can learn and understand things for us to really take them out into the real world and apply them, um, we need to go through a process of embodiment. And I see at the do lectures, um, it's being filled with that. When we first um, came through the the walk with all the installations, right? That was a bit of a ritual. It helped us embody this sense of creativity, of changing things up, of um, being imaginative. When we first came through the door, and we had the sign next to the door, it was this really ritualistic thing, like once you walk in here, be ready for what is do lectures. And I feel rituals, just like marriage and um, rites of passage and that, they help us take understandings and learnings and really make them apparent. And so what I, want to do here is, in your notebooks, right, if everyone can get out their notebooks, it's not mandatory, but if you really feel like you want to embody this story and take it out into the real world, open up a new page and title it The Do Story, right? And so in this notebook, you've been writing down all your learning and understandings. You've been writing what you want to take out of this, how you want to improve yourself, how you might want to help improve others. And The Do Story is about maybe refining that a bit more and feel what, what do you actually want to take out specifically into the wider world. Of those learnings and stuff like that, what do you want to, um, I guess, integrate into your being and how is that going to make an impact out there? And so in the do story, write these things down. So the way I like to think of it is a physical object. Whenever you look at your notebook, you'll be reminded of the story that is here and how every action you take out there is further defining what went on in this space. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's the long story short of why, although I didn't want to tell my story today, because I feel like we've been almost um, saturated with stories, through telling a bit about my short journey and then the nature of stories that come from it, we can think about maybe how we can take the learnings and understandings that come here and make an impact into the real world. So thank you very much. <laughs>